Hello, welcome to this presentation by FERN, the Foundation for the Education and Research in Neurological Emergencies. This educational lecture is titled, The Evaluation of Emergency Department Dizziness Patients, New Concepts. My name is Edward Sloan. I am currently Medical Director of the Physician Assistance Studies Program at Dominican University. I have most recently been an attending physician at Carl Foundation Hospital, and I am Professor Emeritus in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Support for the development of this lecture was provided by EB Medicine. I am currently President and Board Chair of FERN. The content for this lecture comes in large part by the monograph titled The Timing and Triggers Approach to the Patient with Acute Dizziness by Jonathan Edlow. It was published in Emergency Medicine Practice by EB Medicine, December 2019. Other parts of this educational lecture and the complete lecture are available at the Fern.org website or on our YouTube Fern.org channel. Also available is the June 2020 podcast, which was presented to participants in 46 countries, as well as a CME option on the EB Medicine website at ebmedicine.net, as well as at the specific website address noted below. Please note the disclaimer listed below. In general, this information is intended to augment and not replace the clinical judgment that guides the management of any individual patient. Well, let's talk about our specific diagnoses. Remember, we had three strata, six diagnoses. Now let's talk about these specific diagnoses. So we have the three strata, acute vestibular syndrome, spontaneous episodic vertibular or vestibular syndrome, and the triggered episodic vestibular syndrome that leads to these diagnoses. Acute vestibular syndrome. I've got the red rectangle around the common benign causes and the common serious causes and some rare causes. Let's go through them. Vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis is a peripheral benign etiology of dizziness. It's most often a viral etiology, but other etiologies can cause patients to have vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis including bacterial middle ear infection, meningitis, CNS infection, injury or tumor, and or a medicine side effect. Now, labyrinthitis. It's a peripheral benign etiology. It is an inflamed labyrinth or inner ear which transmits abnormal input to the brain through what could be a normal or also diseased vestibular nerve. Please note that both vestibular nerve and labyrinth uh, abnormalities or inflammation can occur at the same time. And therefore, it's hard really to distinguish one from the other, whether it's neuritis or labyrinthitis. So what about vestibular neuritis? Same thing, peripheral benign etiology. It's an inflamed vestibular nerve which transmits input from the labyrinth or inner ear to the brain. So what can happen with neuritis is, although the labyrinth is normal, the vestibular nerve, which carries the input from the labyrinth peripherally to the central brain, is diseased and therefore doesn't transmit input normally, such that the corrective labyrinthine activities can't be activated by the brain centrally. Again, the same other etiologies can cause vestibular neuritis. So, what's the treatment of vestibular neuritis and or labyrinthitis? Steroids to reduce inflammation. Antihistamines such as meclizine for symptomatic relief. You might consider antivirals since it's most often a viral etiology. You need appropriate home support and close follow-up. You need hospital admission for those with questionable signs and symptoms, in which case you can exclude posterior ischemic circulation problems. And you must note again that posterior circulation symptoms can progress quickly. And so observation for 24 to 48 hours, if there's any doubt with stroke team consultation is a good idea. Now, the other cause of acute vestibular syndrome we've talked about repeatedly is posterior circulation stroke symptoms. 
This is a central, serious etiology. It is the most important dizziness etiology that we consider. The dizziness and vertigo, you know, can occur with all different types of diagnoses. It can occur with posterior circulation stroke, but the presence of it doesn't make it a posterior stroke, and the absence of dizziness and vertigo doesn't exclude posterior stroke either. We often will see nausea and vomiting and vertigo with the posterior stroke symptom with the disease, but not always. And we know that we see nystagmus, but it can also be seen with BPPV. What are the findings that would suggest posterior stroke in a patient with acute vestibular syndrome? Headache, not common in, not common in BPPV. Headache is more likely with posterior circulation stroke. Dim vision, diplopia, limb weakness, dysmetria, sensory changes, especially pain and temperature, dysarthria, dysphagia, truncal ataxia, ataxic gait. These are findings that are unique posterior circulation ischemia signs and symptoms not seen with our more benign BPPP diagnosis. These are some other rare AVS diagnoses that are listed including MS, Wernicke's encephalopathy, drug effects, or toxicities. In conclusion, the ATTEST system for the evaluation of the dizzy patient includes the following. A, associated symptoms. T, T, timing and triggers. E, S, examination signs. And T, confirmatory testing. A test. When evaluating an ED patient with dizziness, Please consider the following. Using the ATTEST system for evaluating ED dizzy patients, those patients with acute, severe, continuous symptoms should be considered to have acute vestibular syndrome. Patients who have intermittent symptoms or non-continuous symptoms at the time of evaluation are noted to either have triggered or spontaneous episodes of dizziness and vertigo. Topping the list of diagnoses using the ATTEST system are orthostasis, BPPV, or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, and posterior stroke. BPPV can be diagnosed with the dix Hallpike maneuver and can be treated with the Epley maneuver either in the emergency department or in follow-up. It is noted that you should evaluate patients with caution in the setting of the COVID-19 pandemic as the COVID virus can cause neurological symptoms and or can complicate those neurological symptoms because of poor PO intake and dehydration, which can cause orthostasis. Electronic medical record templates and dot phrases can help to make the exam process more systematic and easily accomplished using the ATTEST system. When evaluating dizziness patients in the emergency department, the following is recommended. Understand that the dizziness pathologies using the ATTEST system fall into three diagnostic strata and basically involve six diagnoses and three specific treatments for those diagnoses. Also recommended is that you study the nystagmus findings, significance, and BPPV maneuvers, Hall, Pike, and Epley, online and in the monograph from which this lecture was obtained. Also, create EMR templates and dot phrases to exclude posterior stroke findings in your dizzy patients in the emergency department. Explain the etiology of the dizziness, including the diagnosis and treatment, and provide appropriate referral for patients with dizziness, explaining to them symptoms which should cause them to come back to the emergency department for repeat evaluation. Lastly, Utilize caution when evaluating dizziness patients in the emergency department in the setting of COVID-19, as this virus has both neurological complications and symptoms and can cause orthostasis due to decreased PO intake. If you have specific questions related to this educational content, please send an email to fern.org at gmail.com. We encourage you to go to the fern.org website for more content related to this educational program and other content related to the care of patients who present to the emergency department with acute illness and injury related to neurological emergencies. Thank you for your participation in this FERN educational program.